All right, everybody, we are ready to get started here. Welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. My name is Mary. I'm going to be your presenter today. Yes, I'm very excited too. Um, and today you're here to see Tour of the Universe, which is one of my favorite shows that we do uh, here at the Morrison Planetarium. I love all the shows that we do, but uh, a lot of the shows that we have throughout the day are pre-recorded movies, basically. And there's just a short little section in them where I can update you on a particular astronomy topic. This show is a bit different. This is a completely live show. So I'm going to be our pilot as we fly around the universe today. We're gonna start out at Earth. We're gonna zoom out as far as we can out into space and then we'll come back safely home at the end. But in order for us to do all of that, I do have to head all the way up the stairs to our pilot's booth, which is right at the top of the room up there. And as I head up, I have just a few quick housekeeping rules to go over. First of all, please no eating or drinking while you're in the planetarium today. And while you're following that first rule, the next rule should be pretty easy. Please make sure to keep your mask on for the whole show. Even once the lights come down, please keep that mask on. If you have a cell phone, a camera, a tablet, anything at all that could give off light or sound, both of those can be very distracting in here. We don't want me to accidentally run into a planet or something because I'm distracted. So make sure to keep those put away during the whole show. For your safety in this dark theater and these very steep stairs that we have here, we do highly recommend staying seated throughout the entire show. But if you do find that you need to leave early for whatever reason, the exits are at the top of the stairs. And last but not least, this can create a very immersive experience. So if at any point you feel any dizziness, any motion sensitivity, just close your eyes for a few seconds and that should help your brain remember you're just sitting in a chair in a planetarium, not actually flying around in space. So without further ado, go ahead and sit back, relax. Give me just a minute to move into our pilot's booth here and we will get started. All right, so we are starting our tour of the universe today, relatively close to home, just a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface at the International Space Station. And you may notice that the Earth below us looks rather uninteresting and dark right now. And that's actually pointing to the fact that everything we're going to see today in the show is based on actual data. So this location of where the International Space Station is, this is where it is right now, and it looks like it's on the nighttime side of the Earth at the moment. And I'm using a software called OpenSpace today, which is actually a free open source software that you could download at home if you have a strong enough computer to do so. Um, and it's all based on real data and uh, images and such. So everything you're gonna see are uh, actual pictures of the locations we're going to go to, or if we don't have pictures of those locations, it is based on actual observations. And I always start out at the International Space Station because this is as far as humans travel out into space right now, just a few hundred miles above the Earth. And we can see where they're going around the Earth. This yellow line that I've put up is their orbit as they're orbiting around us. There's about six or so astronauts on the ISS at any one time. They're going around us very quickly, only takes them about 90 minutes or so. And the reason I like to start out with uh, where humans are right now is because today we're gonna see how far any of our human influence has gone out into space. So we'll see how far human beings have traveled. We'll see how far our spacecraft have traveled. We'll see how far Anything we've sent out into space at all has traveled, and we are going to travel much farther than that with open space today. And as I rotate around, we'll see on the daytime side of the Earth, the cloud patterns and such that uh, were around today, because again, this is all based on actual data. So we have many, many different satellites that are going around us. It's not just the International Space Station going around us. We have hundreds and hundreds of uh, small satellites going around our planet, some of which study things like weather patterns 
and other uh, scientific instruments that we have going around. So those clouds we can see on the right, that's where they were today. But I'm gonna change our focus now to not these uh, artificial or human-made satellites that we have going around the Earth. We're gonna stop at uh, the, the closest natural neighbor that we have going around us. We're gonna fly over to the moon. And the moon is our closest neighbor out here in space. And uh, as I focus on the moon, just a warning, it sometimes moves very quickly. So if this makes you dizzy, close your eyes for a second. There we go. And we're gonna fly over to the moon. And even though the moon is our closest neighbor, it's still about a quarter of a million miles away from us. And this is the farthest that humans have traveled out into space so far. So the Apollo astronauts came out here about 50 years ago. And when they traveled to the moon, took them a couple of days or so to get here. But this is as far as we've gone so far in terms of us physically going and walking around somewhere. And at the moon is where I like to introduce an idea I'm going to use for the rest of the show that has to do with how far we're going to go. So we're already seeing at a quarter of a million miles, even the closest thing to us out here is very, very far away. And today we're gonna to see distances of millions or billions or sometimes trillions of miles or kilometers. And when you get to numbers that large, I don't know about you, but to me, those numbers make no sense whatsoever. So from here on out, I'm going to use a different way of thinking about how far we've gone. We're going to use the speed of light. Now, if you can imagine, and I know this is hard to imagine too, but if you can imagine going the fastest speed we know of in the entire universe, the speed of light, it would take us about one and a half seconds to get to the moon from Earth. So we say the moon is a distance of one and a half light seconds from us because that's how long it would take for light to travel here. So roughly the same amount of time that it took us to just fly over here real quick in open space is about how long it would take if you were really traveling at the speed of light. But I'm not gonna stop too long at any particular place today because we have a long way to go. We're going to go as far as we can out into space. So I'm gonna zoom us away once again from our moon. And then I'm gonna bring up some other lines so we can keep track of the things that we're looking at in our solar system. So this blue line here is showing us the orbit of the moon around us. And then we're also seeing blue lines for the orbits of the planets as they go around the sun. And next I'm gonna focus for just a moment on the very center of our solar system, the closest star to us, the sun. So going from the earth to the moon and then the moon to the sun is already a pretty big jump in distance. So it's one and a half light seconds to get to the moon it's about eight and a half light minutes to get to the sun. So we've already jumped up from just a couple of seconds to several minutes if we were traveling at the speed of light. And there's a couple of different ways I like to think about that. For one thing, if the sun just disappeared for some reason, we wouldn't know about it for eight and a half minutes. Thankfully though, there's no reason why the sun would just disappear. You don't have to worry about that too much. Another way I like to think about it is that if you walked outside, and if it wasn't totally cloudy like it is today in San Francisco, and if you looked at the sun, well, first of all, don't do that. Never look at the sun. But if you looked at the sun, that's how it looked eight and a half minutes ago, not how it looks right now. And within these few light minutes of distance, we're seeing the orbits of the smaller rocky planets in our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and you may notice there's a pretty sizable gap in between Mars and Jupiter here, but that's not totally empty space. That's where we find a lot of the smaller uh, rocky objects in our solar system, but we can't see them right now because they are very, very dim. They're not giving off very much, uh, they're not reflecting very much light uh, compared to the planets. So I'm gonna make them much brighter than, brighter than normal so we can see them. So these are the asteroids. This is the asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter. And this isn't even all of the asteroids, but most of the asteroids, the smaller rocky objects we have here, are in between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. And I don't normally visit the asteroid belt, but today is a special day. Today is asteroid day. So I feel like I must visit at least one location in the asteroid belt. So we're gonna visit the largest object in the asteroid belt just qu uh, real quickly. We're gonna fly over to Ceres. So here's the orbit of Ceres. And something I find very interesting about Ceres is that, well, first of all, 
It's the largest object in the asteroid belt, so that's kind of fun. It is a dwarf planet, and it has a somewhat similar story to another very famous object in our solar system, Pluto. Now, a couple hundred, or I think about 300 or so years ago, uh, is when Ceres was first discovered. And at first, they, uh, people called Ceres a planet because it was a relatively large object in our solar system. We didn't really know about any of the other objects in the asteroid belt yet, so it made sense to call Ceres a planet at the time. But pretty quickly after Ceres was discovered, astronomers were finding all of these other objects. They were finding more and more asteroids as they were exploring our solar system. So pretty quickly after little Ceres here was found, it was changed from being called a planet to being called an asteroid, along with the other objects that astronomers were finding. And so for many, many decades and a couple hundred years or so, Ceres was known as an asteroid and nothing more. But then, uh, not too long ago, several years ago, the Dawn mission was sent out to Ceres and also Vesta, one of the other large objects in the asteroid belt. And we started to learn more about Ceres and learn more about this, what we still were calling the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. But something interesting happened back in 2006, and that is that astronomers started to learn more and more about a bunch of other small objects in our solar system, but this time much, much farther out. Way out beyond Neptune, they were finding a lot of small icy objects, maybe some rocky objects, kind of hard to tell because they're really far away, but lots of objects that they were calling trans-Neptunian objects, and I'll show you where those are. So tons and tons of tons of them that we know about now, but we did not know about any of these until the late 90s and early 2000s. So again, as astronomers started to find more and more of these objects, they began to notice that a lot of them were orbiting around the same area as Pluto. And a few of them were around the same size as Pluto too. So there's the conundrum right there. Astronomers were looking around, finding all these small objects and began to wonder, hmm, how should we categorize these? Should we add on half a dozen more planets? Should we change what these planets are called? What do we wanna do here? So back in 2006, a group of astronomers, the, the International Astronomical Union got together, took a vote and decided on what a planet should be. And there were a few different requirements, but one of the requirements was that a planet needs to clear out its path. Pluto, is part of the Kuiper belt, which is part of the main part of all these trans-Neptunian objects, this kind of belt you can see farther out in our solar system. So Pluto did not fulfill one of the requirements and was changed to the new category of dwarf planet. So during that process, Ceres got a promotion and was changed to a dwarf planet as well. So I like to say that this story is a lovely story about Pluto becoming the biggest dwarf planet in our solar system and Ceres getting a little bit more notoriety and uh, not being ignored as much as it was in the past by becoming a dwarf planet too. And now that we're out here by Pluto, I do wanna show you some of the other objects that we have sent out into space. So we've already very quickly blown past uh, where humans have traveled out into space so far but we do have several spacecraft that we have sent out in, into space. And these yellow lines are showing us where they've gone so far. So these ones in particular are showing us where there are spacecraft that we have sent out into space with the intention of them leaving our solar system behind. So these are Voyager 1 and 2, Pioneer 10 and 11, and New Horizons, which went out to Pluto back in 2015, gave us some really, really awesome pictures of Pluto. But even so, even though these ones have gone very far, some of them have been traveling for over uh, 50 or so years now, roughly, uh, the Voyager spacecraft left in the 70s. None of these spacecraft that we have sent out so far have gone as far as light can travel in a day yet. So we haven't even gone out to multiple light days of distance here. We're still just about a day or so away from our planet if we were traveling at the speed of light. 
And this area that we're going through is kind of a gray area in space of, which is kind of funny, it's looking kind of gray. Um, but anyway, uh, this is kind of a gray area in the sense of, are we still in our solar system or have we left our solar system behind? So what we think of as our solar system is the sun and all the things that are going around the sun. But that's a little tricky to figure out exactly where does that begin and where does that end? Because the sun has a magnetic field, it has gravity, it has comets going around it, all sorts of stuff. So it's a little hard to figure out exactly where that begins and where it ends. But a second ago, you may have noticed the sun's appearance changed a little bit, got a bit brighter. And that's because I was dimming it down before, because if we were looking at the sun with its actual brightness, it would have been difficult to see the other things in our solar system. So now our model of the sun is showing its true brightness. So if we were able to fly out this far, this is how bright the sun would be. And as I zoom away farther, you'll see that the sun is starting to look very similar to the other stars that we were seeing up in our sky before. And if you look around, you'll see that we are starting to fly past some other stars. So once you're this far out and you're starting to fly past other stars, there's no question whatsoever. We are outside of our solar system entirely and we are moving through interstellar space now. But let's check in with how far we've gone. So we were at roughly one light day or so as we were getting past our farthest spacecraft in our solar system. Now we're talking about distances of light years. If we were to travel to the closest star to us outside of our solar system, Proxima Centauri, which is part of the Alpha Centauri system, it would take about four years traveling at the speed of light. So even the closest star out here would take you several years to get to. But we're gonna keep on going. We still have quite a long ways to go as we fly a few tens of light years now away from our solar system. And we're approaching uh, the point where it's gonna be the last time that we can check in with our human influence out here in space because there's only so far that we have sent things out into space. We've already seen how far our spacecraft have gone. So anything we're seeing from here on out is not because we've sent something to these locations, but instead everything we're seeing from here on out is because light from these objects has traveled to us and that light has gone into our telescopes. But there is something that we've sent out and I'll show you where that something is right over here. And that is our radio signals. So ever since the 1930s, we've been sending out radio signals into space that are strong enough to escape our planet and go out into space. And those radio signals are all traveling at the speed of light. And as long as they don't run into anything out there in space, they're just gonna keep on going. And as you can see, things are very spread out out here. So it's pretty rare to run into something out here. So as long as they don't run into anything, they'll just keep traveling at the speed of light in whatever direction they started. And so that is how we get this little grid here, what we call the radio sphere. This is how far any of our radio signals could have gone by now. So this is about 90 or so light years away from us in all directions since the earliest radio signals that we sent out were in the 1930s. But let's keep an eye on the radio sphere this farthest uh, that any of our human signals have reached. Keep an eye on that as we zoom away. And in a moment, our model is gonna switch over a little bit here. So right now we're seeing a map of the closest star to, stars to us in our galaxy, ones that you're perhaps familiar with if you go outside at night and you do some stargazing. But now we're seeing a different kind of model. So now we're seeing more of what we think our galaxy, the Milky Way, would look like if we could fly this far out into space and take a look at it. So this is very much not a image. It's not a picture of our galaxy because like we saw before, we have not actually gone out this far into space yet. Uh, but based on what we can see in our galaxy and based on other galaxies we can see, this is a really good idea of what we think our galaxy would look like if we could go out this far. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, it's pretty flat. I'll rotate around so we can see 
the flat disk of the Milky Way. And I'll give you a second to take a second look here. Make sure you can still see the radio sphere. That little teeny tiny blue dot there. That's how far our human signals have gone. Because we've made another huge leap in distance now. If we were talking about the Milky Way, if we were traveling at the speed of light, which again, as a reminder, fastest speed we know of in the entire universe, if we were to go from one side of the Milky Way to the other, that would take us about 100,000 years. So it's a very, very big galaxy that we live in. But even so, as I zoom away from the Milky Way, we're now seeing lots of other dots. And these dots, these are no longer individual stars like we were seeing before. Every single one of these dots is another galaxy. And every single one of these galaxies has its own billions or sometimes trillions of stars. And if you're curious about the colors of these galaxies, I'm sad to say these are not the actual colors of the galaxies. I do think it would be fun if it looked like cosmic Skittles out there in the universe. But no, <laughs> these are color coded based on a variety of different things. Usually we color code galaxies based on uh, what survey they're part of. So uh, for instance, what telescope was used to map out that particular galaxy. Or sometimes we'll group them in terms of uh, what other galaxies they're around. So galaxies form in these different groups and clusters together. But this is, in fact, this is a map. This is an actual map of where these galaxies are. We've seen where they are with our telescopes and we've mapped them out where they are in space. And because of that, that means that our map looks a little bit strange when we get this far out. So we're seeing a shape that looks sort of like a hourglass or a butterfly or maybe a bow tie, something like that. Once again, I'm sad to say the universe is not shaped like a butterfly, but uh, this shape that we are seeing is because we're looking at all of this from our perspective here on Earth. So when we look in the directions that we're seeing these gaps on the top and the bottom, those are where our galaxy is. So we live in the Milky Way galaxy, it has shaped pretty flat like a disk, it has gas, it has dust, it has stars, it has planets, it has all sorts of stuff in it. And so when we try to look in the direction of our galaxy, of that disk, it's blocking our view, making it so we can't see too well over in those directions. So there are even more galaxies than this, and we think probably just as many galaxies in the directions of those gaps as in the other two directions, but we just haven't been able to map them out quite yet so far. And at this point, we are looking at distances of billions of light years. This light has traveled for a very long time to get to us and get into our telescopes. And because of that, there's kind of a fun aspect to that as well, in that we're sort of time traveling in a way when we observe these galaxies way out here. Because since it does take so long to get here, that by the time we're seeing these objects, we're seeing them what they were like in the past. So for instance, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, if you were to look at the sun, again, don't do that, don't look at the sun, but if you were to look at the sun, that's how the sun looked eight and a half minutes ago. Not right now. And this, what we're looking at with these galaxies, is what our uh, universe was like billions of years ago. And because of that, that means there's only so far that I can take you. There is an edge to everything that we can see in our entire universe, what we call the edge of our visible universe. And that is all over the dome here now, what we call the cosmic microwave background. Now, when you walk outside at night and you look up at the sky, you're not going to see this everywhere you look in the sky. Thank goodness, that would scare me. Uh, but if you could see microwave light, a lower energy form of light that our eyes can't see, but our telescopes can see, then you would see this every single place you look. And this is light that was around a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So this is the earliest light that we can see. So I like to refer to it as the baby picture of our universe, since it's the earliest light that we can detect. But since this is the edge of where we can go, that means we've got to wrap up our journey and fly on back home. Now keep in mind, as we fly on home, 
If we were really traveling at the speed of light and if we were really this far away, this journey would take us about 13 and a half billion years. But thankfully we're in the planetarium, it should only take a couple minutes. And as we zoom on back home, one last thing I do like to leave folks with is that all of this we've been looking at is not even everything we know to be in our universe. There's some really mysterious things out there, things that we call dark matter and dark energy. Dark energy is some mysterious force that is causing space itself to accelerate as it expands. Dark matter is some mysterious sub substance that we don't know exactly what it is, but we know that it doesn't interact with light how we expect. And while we don't know exactly what these two things are, we do know that combined, they make up about 96% of our universe. So all of this that we've been seeing is a teeny tiny fraction of everything that we know to be out there. And that may make people feel rather small and kind of uncomfortable. And I agree, that makes me feel kind of uncomfortable sometimes too, but one way I like to think of it is that, well, yes, we are this one tiny dot in this gigantic universe, but look at all of this that we have found so far. And there's a whole lot more to discover and a whole lot more to learn about. And that's pretty exciting. But even so, I'm always pretty relieved when we get back to the radio sphere, back to our home human realm of the universe as we've got about 90 or so light years left to go. In a moment, we will re-enter our solar system and see the farthest spacecraft that we have sent out so far. And we're gonna head back to the third planet from the sun, which is also the only place in all of this that we have found life at all so far, which is another pretty incredible thing to think about. And with that, we are back home, hooray! So I wanna thank you all for joining me today for our tour of the universe. I hope you enjoyed flying around in space with me today and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for coming.